కాబట్టి వెళ్ళి రావాల్సిన టైం థ్యాంక్ యూ ఆర్గనైజ్ ఫర్ దర్ ఆపర్చునిటీ Uh, coming uh, to the topic diagnosing posterior uveitis mm-hmm. i think it's a big challenge for the clinicians to mm-hmm. diagnose a case of uh, posterior uveitis but the uh, uveitis experts have sort of formulated mm-hmm. an algorithm and uh, it helps us to arrive to a proper diagnosis of posterior uveitis so whenever we see a patient of posterior uveitis we need to ask few questions to ourselves is it choroiditis retinitis or retinochoroiditis if there is involvement of retinal vessels optic nerve head and vitreous whether it is infective or looking non infective whether the patient is immunocompetent or immunocompromised whether it's a part of masquerade syndrome whether the clinical picture is complication of ongoing disease or is it recurrence of really heel disease we need to really differentiate the two and look for any association of systemic disease apart from all these questions what is also very important is a very meticulous history taking in case of uveitis that includes medical history travel history to area that are endemic to known causes of uveitis like tuberculosis age sometimes also gives clue to etiology of uveitis like toxoplasmosis syphilis or cmv are known to have congenital transmission also toxoplasmosis and toxocariasis are most common causes of infective uveitis in children herpes simplex in middle aged patient with uh, retinal um, necrosis and varicella zoster uh, in elderly patient for viral retinitis again durations of symptoms also kind of gives clue to the etiology like uh, if the patient has viral retinal necrosis the patient has very rapidly progressive loss of vision whereas in cases of toxoplasmosis or peshets it would take one to two weeks after the onset of sim- symptoms for the patient to go to a clinician and fungal uveitis usually have very slow insidious process also environmental triggers like exposure to cats uh, hints at towards uh, ocular toxoplasmosis exposure to cats for uh, dog, uh, sorry exposure to dogs for toxocariasis tick bites and lyme disease and also we need to see if the patient is immunocompromised or immunocompetent in immunocompetent patient arn arn is usually secondary to herpes virus rather than other viral etiology whereas in immunocompromised patient varicella zoster cmv retinitis can be thought of sorry so now we first come to retinitis retinitis has more chances of being infective it can be focal or diffuse uh, focal retinitis can uh, have uh, toxoplasma as reason also bechets can have focal retinitis but it is usually associated with some amount of vasculitis toxoplasma usually uh, what we see is headlight in the fog appearance it will have very dense vitreitis on top of uh, a very bright yellow cream lesion like we see in the first picture but as it can be diffuse uh, retinitis we can think of viral at first and it can be very rarely secondary to toxoplasmosis now in immuno compromised patients we can think of cmv retinitis but also the picture is very classic that has a lot of hemorrhages granular necrosis and amount of angio- angitis coming to choroiditis choroiditis can be focal like in tb and toxoplasma granuloma like in tb usually it is single oval hemorrhages and cnv on top of that for granuloma sarcoid granulomas are usually multiple can also have a toxocara granuloma can have an underlying foreign body or also be fungal in origin and if we see any definite pattern of choroiditis then we have to think of y dot syndrome so uh, like i said the tb granuloma has a very typical picture oval single and some amount of hemorrhage or cnvm can be top of all that lesion there so next coming to choroiditis that is white dot syndrome if the lesions are subtle we can think of multiple evanescent white dot syndrome if it is prominent we can think of multifocal choroiditis if the lesions are discrete then we can think of new spunked inner choroidopathy multifocal choroiditis or birdshot chorioretinopathy if the lesions are plocoid then we can think of apm pp or serpiginous choroiditis now serpiginous choroiditis is very common in our setup and we need to differentiate between serpiginous and serpiginous like choroiditis in these patients serpiginous choroiditis have larger plocoid lesions uh, the lesions usually start from the disc have autoimmune uh, origin these are usually non tb and doesn't have vitreitis as such 
whereas serpiginous like choroiditis are usually infective, has TB as the cause. These are small placoids, starts from mid periphery and has vitritis and vasculitis along with the lesion. Now, apart from all these pictures uh, that we see and come to a diagnosis, what also helps is investigations in these patients like color fundus photography, fundus fluorescent angiogram and autofluorescence. Serial documentations helps us in documenting and uh, monitoring the management of these diseases. In autofluorescence, there is diffuse halo of hyperautofluorescence throughout the lesions in active stage, which gradually becomes hypoautofluorescent along with modeling as the lesion heals. FFA usually has characteristic early hypo, hypofluorescence and late hyperfluorescence in active disease. And in Beschitz, there is usually a definite diffuse fall like capillary leak along with retinitis. ICG is not usually performed in our setup. However, it is usual where the lesions are deep choroid, uh, has a CNV or hemorrhage on top of the lesions or in white dot syndromes. OCT is again very helpful. Uh, it helps on differentiate a lot of disease, including choroidal granuloma, masquerades, and a lot of diseases Dr. Rohan already has pointed out in his topic of OCT. USG also helps us uh, to uh, diagnose and document subretinal abscesses, granuloma, osteoma, and choroidal thickness. OCTA is useful for early detection and follow-up for CNVM. It is non-invasive tool for detecting activity. And these days, non-invasive technologies like fundus photography, OCT, uh, autofluorescence, and OCT are better preferred than ICG and FFA for diagnosing uh, any posterior segment diseases. But, but we also have to think that not everything that is yellow in, uh, in the fundus is posterior uveitis. It could be exudative CSCR, the fibrin that is beneath the retina that looks like choroidal lesion. But uh, doing FFA and OCT in these cases can uh, really help us clear out what the pathology is. And also vitelli form lesion. It might look like uh, multifocal choroiditis, but it is usually not the case and we can perform autofluorescence and FFA in these cases as well and uh, differentiate between choroiditis and all these lesions. Apart from all these investigations and if we think that it is still not conclusive we can go for chest x-ray, HRCT, MON2, gold quantiferone, uh, ACE, ELISA for toxoplasma, IgG, IgM and RPR and TPH at least. Yeah. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry for all the delay that I made. Thank you Dr. Roshida. I think it was very short and sweet and very <laughs> comprehensive. Yeah. So I think Dr. Pujari is already waiting. So I think we need to close.